Hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Goldfarb, and I'm a speech language pathologist and certified oral facial myologist. And this is Airway Answers, Expanding Your Breath of Knowledge. And I'm here with Dr. Michael Gunson, who is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon in Santa Barbara. So I'm going to read his bio, and we're going to uh, have a wonderful interview because I am so interested, as probably most of you are, in questions about the TMJ, jaw surgery, and so much more. So let me first read the bio for Dr. Gunson. Um, he practices at Arnett Gunson Facial Reconstruction in Santa Barbara, California. Beautiful office, by the way. I've been there. It is beautiful. He graduated from UCLA Dental School and Medical School and received his specialty certificate in oral and maxillofacial surgery from UCLA. Dr. Gunson partnered with Dr. Arnett at the Center for Corrective Jaw Surgery in Santa Barbara, California, and their surgical practice was limited to facial reconstruction, performing thousands of corrective jaw surgeries. Dr. Gunson presently, presently diagnoses and treats patients with facial aesthetic and functional problems, as well as sleep conditions. Dr. Gunson's orthognathic and aesthetical surgical techniques provide accurate, aesthetic, and functional results that improve patient health and satisfaction. Dr. Gunson's also an associate clinical professor at Boston University, a resident faculty at Spear Education, and has hospital privileges at Galetta Valley College Hosp or Cottage Hospital and Stanford University Hospital. He loves teaching and lectures throughout the world and publishes research on orthognathic surgery, facial function and aesthetics, obstructive sleep apnea, and the treatment of TMJ arthritis and condylar resorption. This is all great, all up our airway alley, because <laughs> I think... You know, just to start, a quick thought is that I think we know human beings, the majority are suffering from some airway dysfunction just due to um, evolutionary epigenetic changes in the way that the human face has changed in the growing pattern. And a lot of us can probably benefit from jaw surgery, me <laughs> being one of those. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, I think, do whatever we can to avoid surgery. There's some who are like right on it, but... Um, Surgery is probably my biggest fear. Uh, so I think maybe sometimes when people see you, it might have been they've tried 10 million other things until they get to you. I don't know. What's your experience with patients when they find you? Have they been avoiding um, and doing all different other things? Or are, do you find the majority of patients are like, I need surgery, I'm doing it? <laughs> oh, that's uh, I like that question. Um it's been my experience uh, in doing consultations that when patients come for the consultation, that invariably they've they've had treatment, and most commonly they've had a lot of orthodontic treatment. So uh, it's very rare that I that I consult a patient uh, who hasn't been in orthodontics once, twice, three times, or orthodontic treatment for you know five plus years. And I don't know, I don't know that it's an attempt to avoid surgery because there are two parties involved in I think the treatment that they were given. Uh, the, and the two parties being the family or the patient and the clinician. And so I think on one side of the equation you have the family, which you know, nobody wants surgery especially if it's explained to them that, you know, somebody's going to break your face and, and, you know, there, there are ways to describe it that are obviously quite disheartening. Um, but I think at the same time, there, are, there are lots of clinicians that, um, that don't want their patients to have surgery for various reasons. And the list of those reasons are long in my experience. So I think I think um, there's a certain paternalistic approach from from orthodontists and others to avoid surgery for fear of financial constraints, um, for being the one responsible for having them go through a prolonged recovery. Um, I think more often than not, orthodontists don't refer for surgery because of the experiences that they've had with surgical results. Uh, the surgery is 
and when I say surgery, I mean orthognathic surgery, so jaw surgery. Um, I think they've had results that they don't they don't like, that they don't. Um, the surgery is known for being a little, not a little, but uh, inaccurate. Uh, that the published articles on the accuracy of orthognathic surgery are not great. Um, and so imagine an orthodontist who knows that a patient maybe ought to have jaw surgery, but sending that patient to have jaw surgery and then getting the result back and having the result not be the the best result and then the orthodontist having to deal with managing the bite and asymmetries that result from the surgery and and the orthodontist can't really blame the surgeon you know the orthodontist can't say well the surgery was inaccurate because the orthodontist is the one that provided the referral so it's you know it's a pretty untenable situation so if you take that professional experience with jaw surgery you know, a lot of there are people in my hometown who and across the country, orthodontists who will never make the orthognathic surgery referral for those reasons. Also, as soon as surgery comes out of the mouth, sometimes the patient is off to the orthodontist down the street who won't use the surgery word and they've lost their start. So it's really rough. Um, I think the way to overcome it is, I think most patients, if you can discuss um, what it's like for them to live within their bodies and, and have that like, you know, connection with them, uh, that you understand what they're going through in living in their bodies and that it's not comfortable for them and that surgery can relieve that discomfort, uh, that most patients are willing to do just about anything. Yeah, especially um, those with severe pain, which we see a lot mm -hmm. of those patients. So um, when you said kind of unpredictable or maybe inaccurate, the surgery, uh, orthognathic surgery, is that just because there's different providers or is it in general, it can't be so predictable? No, it can be predictable. It's, um, um, there... Uh, so I gathered I gathered uh, as many research articles as exists on accuracy of orthognathic surgery and the um, the inaccuracy. So if we just look at positioning the lower jaw in the face as intended, mm -hmm. uh, so you take the pre-op plan and then you have the post-op result and you analyze how close to the post-op or the pre close to the pre-op plan, the post-op result was mm -hmm. the the variance is anywhere from uh, three quarters of a millimeter to four millimeters, and um, some of those studies actually don't start counting inaccuracy until it gets to say one and a half millimeters. Mm -hmm. So anybody below a one and a half millimeter discrepancy would be considered okay and they wouldn't start counting that as an inaccuracy. So if if statisticians statisticians and uh, clinicians are weighing the data uh what they are saying in their bias is that they're admitting that the surgery is inaccurate to the tune of one and a half millimeters uh, on average. And that bears it that bears out in the research. So the question is why is it inaccurate? Well, um, a lot of those, a lot of that has been uh, discussed by my partner when he was in practice, published a lot about uh, joint positioning at surgery mm -hmm. and uh, being kind to the joints at surgery. And I think that uh, sometimes uh, orthognathic surgeons don't recognize where they don't understand where the inaccuracy comes from in the surgery, that it does often come at our own hands in attempting to try to position the joints or how how we apply the uh, hardware, you know, the fixation, the plates, the screws. Sometimes in the application of the hardware, even the technique can result in inaccuracy. So it 
it's avoidable. Okay. Um, by all means, it's avoidable. Um, but it requires a lot of focus and attention. And it's it's interesting even for me to travel the world and listen to my colleagues and look at their websites and appreciate those inaccuracies as being presented even at meetings. Um, uh, looking at the midlines and how they line up in the face or don't line up in the face, because that's the expression of the inaccuracy is really, does the bite line up? Are the midlines in the middle? Mm -hmm. And is there a tilt to the face? And those are the resulting, those are the results of inaccuracy with the jaw surgery. Um, so totally avoidable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard. Um, and even in my own, and, and I discovered this uh, early on in my own surgeries, I was like, why, why am I not getting what I want to get at the level that I want to get it? And that, that required a lot of self-analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, I hired my own, I hired an assistant to perform symmetry exams and tests. We did our own research on our, on our patients through the years, adjusted came up with new techniques and uh, refine, refine. So it requires looking, which is really step one. And is there like in this day and age, more or a lot of digital surgical planning that makes the surgeries more accurate? Um, so that's good. That's a great question too. So I would say you you would have a hard time finding a surgeon doing analog preparation. For surgery, it's it would be ridiculous. It takes a lot of time to do it the old way. Um, so digital planning is pretty much, I think, uh, the norm in okay. our in planning for a surgery. We I think we all plan in this uh, 3D virtual space. I don't think that's I think we've all made the conversion to that. Okay. But so. The, the clinician, whether you have a, again, the, the saying is, is modern um, advances in, in treatment give us a new way to do the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, some, of the, some of the ways that we do the wrong thing with digital, for example, is now, you know, before when we were using lateral cephalograms, two-dimensional profile views to plan surgery, we had to orient the profile um, in space. And it was this dimension only, you know, mm -hmm. as, as you project sideways and you look forward, mm -hmm. we're only orienting in this kind of sagittal plane, this up and down plane. But now we have a three-dimensional object. We have this plane, this plane, and this plane now that we have to orient this 3D structure. And this is a very common error in jaw surgery is to rely on old normative mm -hmm. uh, orientation techniques, such as Frankfurt horizontal to position the head. And mm -hmm. Frankfurt horizontal is like, it was, it was created in order to standardize lateral head films across all patients so that we could perform uh, population analysis to look at norms or normals. And it has nothing to do with how people hold their head, yeah. how they develop, um, aesthetically what's best. And yet, um, if you ask the 3D planning services across the country, what the number one technique is for orienting the 3D structure in a sagittal plane, mm -hmm. it's, Frank it's Frankfurt horizontal. They just say, oh, just leveled to Frankfurt. And, and so that's an error. Um, it's an error in how the face gets projected uh, versus how people hold their head. So digital is great. It does allow us to be very uh, much more precise. But again, there are lots of lots of places where we we can make error. And going back to the inaccuracy of the surgery itself, the digital plan has nothing to do with that. Yeah. It's, more it's the how technique. you execute. It's how you execute in the yeah. operating room. Yeah. And, and um, now, okay, so now we have a, something new. We have custom plating systems. So they can actually print titanium plates. 
that fit the surfaces of the bone in the jaw's new position. And with cutting guides and screw guides and this 3D directed custom plated titanium plates. And the research of doing that in the upper jaw is fantastic. Um, it's really good. And um, it allows doctors to put screws where the bone is in the face. And um, so positioning of the upper jaw with custom plates is, is pretty great. Positioning of the lower jaw with okay. custom plates is not great because it relies on the ability of the surgeon to achieve what we call a, you know, a centric relation in the office with the patient awake um, with all their interferences and all their brackets on their teeth versus the position, quote, centric relation of the jaw when they're asleep mm -hmm. and paralyzed in the operating room with mm -hmm. no interferences. So where is that joint position? And if you're making a custom plate based on a joint position in the office where a patient is posturing, which almost everybody does, mm -hmm. and then you go to the operating room and you try to recreate that in a patient who's asleep, mm -hmm. not happening. So, so custom plates in the upper, great, wonderful. Custom plates in the lower and the lower jaw, not so much. But I think... Um, and kind of out in the weeds here with, you know, accuracy with the jaw surgery. But these are these are important things that, you know, my profession has to has to work through. And um, I think the advances are fantastic. Digital virtual planning uh, changed my career, uh, enables me to, to go home and be with my family instead of staying in the office doing lab work for hours on end. Yeah, so it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and ac and and planning accuracy. So when you learn to orient the head in its proper position and treat to that position, it's uh, it's much better too. So that's, yeah. you know, can be more accurate. Right. Um, do you find now? I'm totally off the questions I was going to ask because I'm like, oh no, okay. I'll stay focused. But I'm just thinking. Um, okay, so every orthodontist that I saw, and I, you know, ensured I went to people who are really airway minded, um, not just looking at teeth because my bite looked great, but um, airway and breathing and body posture. They all said you need jaw surgery. Like mm -hmm. everyone said that. They said we can try other things, but I definitely cannot guarantee you anything that you're going to breathe better, sleep better. These things may help, but you ultimately need jaw surgery. And probably they would have all been happy had I just gone and got surgery, but that I'm the one that's going to avoid that because that's, I fear <laughs> that's my, that's scary to me. But, um, so I did like, the, I did the MSC, um, and I definitely breathe better, feel better, sleep better, postures better, but I know for sure that did not completely correct my issues by any means. Um, I, feel like I have, I was always a nose breather as an adult, as a child, not so much. I look at the ba my baby photos and I'm like, whoa, I am a myofunctional disaster, mouth wide open, huge baggy eyes, tongue hanging out. But as an adult, I, I always breathe through my nose, but I felt like my airflow through the nose was a lot better after the MSE. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe with my chin down without going into like a class three. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't get any air. And I, my husband does yoga and all this stuff. And I'm like, I can't do that because I just can't breathe when I'm on my back doing things. After the MSC, I could breathe, I can breathe, get a deep breath of air through my nose without posturing my jaw forward. So there's a lot of like subtle changes that really changed. They're huge changes. I feel like my sleep is better. However, I just need both my jaws like a lot forward. Mm -hmm. Like I can feel. <laughs> I just need them more for. So it helped and it resolved enough, but I know more is probably needed. Mm -hmm. And I was a child that was a class two put in a headgear. So I know my both jaws need to be more for it. And so as I'm just sitting here, I rest. I want to bring my large jaw like that. That feels good to me. So um, it's just interesting, but all the orthodontists did tell me you need jaw surgery. And even Dr. Ting, who's my current orthodontist, I think I was telling him about something recently and he's like, just get jaw surgery. Like, So it's interesting, but I did have a question about the um, 
Like MSC, I've heard because it expands at the midline palatal suture, sometimes that can be beneficial before MMA surgery because does MMA not do a midline split or can you just describe that process? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. And, um, and you, you will hear differing opinions on that matter um, from different clinicians. Um, so uh, how to answer that question. Um, let me address simply how uh, maxillary surgery, uh, meaning orthognathic surgery versus a pad born or even rapid palate expansion, any like a suture expansion versus a jaw surgery expansion. So um, both expand in the same place. So when you do a suture expansion um, with, say, you know, MARPI, MSE, whatever the acronym of the day is for maxillary sutural expansion, you are, you are making the nasal passageways uh, wider. But also when you perform multi-segment maxillary orthognathic surgery, the cuts that are placed to expand the maxilla are actually placed in the nasal floor. So when I do the maxillary surgery, um, and I can send you some images if you'd like, um, splice them in like right now, no, in the video, but um, yeah, okay. the, you can see that the expansion occurs within the nose itself. And so the lateral nasal walls are expanding, the palate's expanding with the maxillary surgery. So then the question is, well, um, what is this idea then that sutural expansion is or might be better than orthognathic expansion? And as is usual in our profession, I think we are looking at the problem in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. um, so my ability at jaw, at, if I go to surgery, my ability to expand the maxilla is completely based on the template of the occlusion of the lower jaw. So wherever the orthodontist places the lower teeth in a transverse dimension, that's where the upper teeth are going because when I'm done, I need the bite to fit together, right? So is the patient, obviously. So if I go to surgery and the orthodontist has not decompensated or uprighted the lower teeth, adequately my expansion is then limited mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. whereas if you do a sutural expansion the orthodontist in expanding the upper jaw can then uncouple the bite of somebody whose lower teeth are tipped in towards the tongue from compensation so having expanded the upper now the the orthodontist is totally capable of decompensating the lower teeth. Mm -hmm. Whereas I find in preparation for jaw surgery because of coupling or other reasons that orthodontists have a really hard time prepping surgery with lower decompensation, with the lingual root torque that's necessary, mm -hmm. bringing those roots back into the bone and uprighting those lower yeah. molds. Um, it's, it's what I prefer, it's what I really would like to see going into surgery, so then I can expand the upper jaw, mm -hmm. you know, the same amount. And and they ask that question all the time, um, well, Dr. Gunson, how much can you expand a maxilla at surgery? And the answer is whatever I need to. Um, I've expanded upper jaws. You know, the the average expansion I would say in the office is five or six millimeters, but. 50, I mean, 10, 12 millimeters, 13 millimeters of expansion. And being reminded again that that expansion occurs at the floor of the nose. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, the you bring up a good point about yourself. Um, when, when jaws develop, 
you know, there are, there are three main directions of jaw growth. It's, it's forward, it's wider, and it's vertical. And when there's growth deficiency in an anterior posterior dimension, there's likely growth deficiency in the transverse dimension. So I would say that, yes, you know, you were treated in the transverse dimension and what you're describing is, is an anterior posterior dimension. Hmm. And we also have to, well, maybe we can touch on it later, but we, we also have to talk about like, what, what are we doing functionally as human beings when we don't grow right? Um, what are our compensations? I mentioned the compensations of the lower teeth when the upper when the upper jaw is not uh, growing as it should. Um, but there are functional compensations, postural, how we hold our head, how we stand, where we put our jaw. You described it too. You I described know. it very well, wanting to have your jaw further forward. And is that solely airway based or is there something about your face that requires the lower jaw to be further forward? Something functional, speech driven or, you know, mouth closure driven, Yeah, those kinds of things. So, um, but that's a digression, you know, coming back to sutural expansion versus orthognathic expansion, they, they're not very different from each other. Um, there are. The, again, back to technique, there are traditional ways of expanding the maxilla at orthodontic surgery that are not as effective as other ways. So where the surgeon places the cuts in the palate can limit expansion or okay. can maximize expansion. So we're back again to technique. And this is something that uh, Rebecca Bacow and I, we, we teach a course in Seattle every year. And uh, we talk about chocolate cake, you know, uh, we talk about how, you know, everybody loves chocolate cake. Chocolate cake's amazing, wonderful, delicious, wonderful. You know, we all want to eat chocolate cake, but really do we? I mean, just because we call it chocolate cake doesn't mean we really want to eat it. You know, my child could make a chocolate cake versus Renault down at the French, French uh, patisserie who could make a chocolate cake. and. Those are not the same. In fact, you could give my child a recipe and give Renault the same recipe. And it's mm. going to be a different result. So orthognathic surgery is like chocolate cake. You don't, just because you call it orthognathic surgery doesn't mean you're getting the same result because the techniques are different and it drives a functional and accurate and aesthetic outcome that's different from yeah. Person. In any field, right? You can see a any functional field. therapist, a physical therapist, and it might be a completely different treatment. And patients or other physicians' perspective might change because they might think that's what myofunctional therapy is, or that's what physical therapy is based on that right. provider. So yeah, you right. definitely want to do your research before having something like a jaw surgery to make sure the person you're going to has a lot of experience in the issues and concerns that you have. And when you were just talking about functional shift of the jaw, wow, after doing these zooms and watching myself, I had no idea. Like I know it, my jaw shifts to the right all the time, like yeah. all these yeah. things. So you start seeing it and noticing it and you pay attention and say, whoa, my jaw wants to rest forward. And I already knew my posture is horrible, you know, probably to help me breathe, but it's such a cascade of events from childhood. And um, it makes me think, in childhood, if we can talk a little bit about TMD and kind mm. of the evolution of TMJ problems, maybe you can talk about different types of problems that occur with the TMJ and how those can kind of evolve through the lifespan. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, I. Uh, so, I mean, let's take a let's take a really big broad look at it um you know oftentimes the patient comes to the office right and says hey doc i have tmj right and um and really you, i i often like to be a smart aleck and say well yeah you have two of them right <laughs> and and uh in our profession we don't do ourselves any favors either by then referring to problems in the face whether it be pain or other issues, as TMD or temporomandibular dysfunction. 
that definition, if you look at the research, is so broad and so unhelpful, really, for the clinician that we get lost in, in our profession. But I think what we need to do is we need to break out what's truly happening by system and by by the experience of the patient. And I think for the most part, we can divide this temporal mandibular dysfunction or complaints into three categories. And they are, there is either a problem that is intracapsular, so it's within the joint itself. And that is usually a problem that is generated by ligament and cartilage and or bone uh, related issues of the joint proper. So intracapsular inside the capsule of the joint. Then the second is muscular. And the third would be neurologic. And those are those are the hard ones to deal with. But so what do I mean by that? Well, if somebody comes into the office and says, I have TMJ, and you say, oh, I'm sorry that you're going through that. Well, what does that mean? Um, to some patients, it means that they click when they open and close and it makes some noise or they hear like sand, sandpaper noises in their joint. Well, that's, that's intracapsular, right? That's, that's a disc incoordination. That's a cartilage cap problem uh, in the joint. Uh, but if somebody comes in and says, well, I have pain, and the, the best, easiest thing to do as a clinician is say, point to where it hurts. And, you know, invariably, they're like, here, you know, or here, or they go behind the jaw, they're like, here, mm -hmm. and you ask them, then you ask them, well, does it hurt, like, right in front of your ear? Uh, no. Well, that's not intracapsular. Mm -hmm. Now we're dealing with muscular problems. And then you start getting into um, areas where it's like burning pain or persistent pain, and, and those kinds of things are, are very neurological. So now, now having localized the issues, is it intracapsular or muscular, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what causes muscular pain? Mm -hmm. You know, or what causes intracapsular problems? Mm -hmm. And that's the next big step. So um, usually, and most often, muscular problems in the face are caused by compensation. Mm -hmm. They're caused by overuse or inappropriate use. Uh, you brought up, you, it was great. You're like, I, I watch myself on Zoom and I'm seeing I'm doing things with my jaw. I think all clinicians should grab their iPads and record their patients speaking, yeah. talking and interacting uh, from the side and from the front because, and then slow it down and go slow and watch what they're doing with their mouth and their teeth and their lips. You will be your mind will be blown mm -hmm. at the crazy things that people do with their jaws and their mouth mm -hmm. but we don't see it we just we're just talking to somebody we don't appreciate how people are talking because it's often too fast so you have somebody take for example somebody with a bit of an overjet maybe a slight class two patient and um, what does it take for that person for example to to not lisp Mm -hmm. What does it take for that patient to have crisp pronunciation? Because they want it. We all want, to, nobody wants to lisp. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to hear themselves speak incorrectly or be called out for it. So what does it take for that person to do it? Well, it takes advancing the jaw into the S position mm -hmm. to overcome the overjet. Mm -hmm. That constant advancement into, the, into that S position all day long, mm -hmm. it's going to be a pterygoid problem. So mm -hmm. these are the patients that are going to come in grabbing behind their jaws like this. Mm -hmm. They're like, it hurts here. It hurts here all the time. So, and that's just a speech compensation, right? Yeah. Then we have people who can't get their lips together because they're too far apart, whether vertical or horizontally. Uh, that's another problem. It's like holding the jaw forward. Um, pterygoid problem. Pterygoid problem. So then we go to the... You know, well, what if the masseters are activated? Where does that come from? And then there's a whole laundry list there. But um, that's 
you know, in our minds as clinicians, if a muscle hurts, it's overused. So then the next reasonable question is why? <laughs> why? What is this person doing day in, day out that is causing them to overuse their muscles? And we have to stop saying things like, well, it's bruxism. It's mm -hmm. clenching. Because as soon as you give it that term or that name, while it's a real thing, as soon as you give it that name, you're done. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? I mean, you're better off trying to discover what, what it is that's really setting them off. Um, are the muscles, for example, worse in the morning versus at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. uh, are, are they worse after they eat? Um, you know, these are all functional questions. Mm -hmm. and that that should help you decide what it is what it is that's the compensation for the muscular problems. Mm -hmm. So that's a broad introduction to like quote TMD, but that helps form an answer to the question as to why do people get it? Mm -hmm. And and so I've brought up a few, you know, yeah. reasons. No, this is a, I've written so yeah. many notes here because when you're saying it's a great idea. Record your patient speaking, slow yeah. down the video, which is so interesting. I feel like sometimes I don't listen to people because I'm too busy watching, <laughs> watching what they're doing. I'm like, oh, wait, what did you say? I wasn't listening. Yeah, I have to keep that in my mind. But I do notice a lot of people posture that lower jaw forward for the sibling sound. So for the S, I mean, I do it too. Yeah. Especially if you need to over articulate, like presenting someone's bio. I'm looking at it. I'm like, <laughs> wow. It, it's almost like, should that maybe be the correct functional resting position of the jaw? If you need to posture your lower jaw forward for speech sounds, it probably should be resting more forward structurally, right? It's kind of like a diagnostic. <laughs> it should. It should um, the, jaw needs, the jaws need to function with the least amount of effort possible. And, and so to transition from a rest position to an S position, which is an active movement, it needs to be with as little effort. So, so then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the problem? And, um, you know, dentally, for the dentist listening, I like to say when I, when I teach, I, I like to say that everything I ever learned, everything I ever needed to know about my profession and helping patients, I learned in removable. Okay. Now, removable dentistry is the is dentistry for making dentures. So you take somebody who doesn't have any teeth, and you have to put a set of teeth in their mouth, and you have they have to be able to chew, and you don't want them to get knocked out. You know, nobody likes having their dentures fall out. They have to be able to speak, um, to chew, to breathe, uh, to move their lips appropriately. Um, they have to do all these things. And for hundreds of years, there have been techniques to figure out how to put a set of teeth in the mouth that are most beneficial to a patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, all the techniques that we use for putting an ideal set of teeth into somebody's mouth, we barely use <laughs> on our patients who actually have teeth. Yeah. Right? We don't we don't say to ourselves, oh, these teeth and jaws are in the wrong place. You know, I need to remake them. You know, that's not our thought process. Whereas in removable, it's like, oh, my denture, I made this wrong. I'm going to redo this and we're going to change the vertical dimension or we're going to change this or that. But for some reason, like there's okay, so there's a term in removable called closest speaking space. Right? It it is that it's that space. Mm -hmm. So what's really cool is the, the term space, uh -huh. which we need space in our mouths to function, but just not too much space. Mm -hmm. So it's that, it's that place where we can speak without moving too far. Closest mm -hmm. speaking space. Mm -hmm. Has anybody making dental implants or deciding where orthodontically to move the anterior teeth, have they ever asked themselves, what is this patient's closest speaking space? And are they there? And if they're not there, how can I put them there? And is right. there a test or a screening to do that? Like perhaps you say certain words with yeah. a sound? Okay. 66. 
just happen to yeah, speak or exactly. it's not particular things, but just a regular conversational sample? Or do you, because isn't there something like, yeah, I want them to say 66, like say S's. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now. Yeah, that's, that's the published. I mean, if you look at the removable <laughs> books, that's exactly, you know, what they but ask. The test is speaking, just talk and speaking. what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, and observing. So, yeah. so we come back to this idea again of a, they put the dentures in the mouth and let's say that as you're functioning and speaking, the denture pops out. Mm. Well, what's causing the denture to pop out? Forces, mm -hmm. uh, usually lip forces or inappropriate tongue and cheek forces. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, when somebody's jaws grow incorrectly and there are inappropriate lip and cheek and tongue forces on the teeth, our teeth don't pop out of our head, mm -hmm. but the pressure on the teeth moves teeth mm -hmm. and causes them to erupt. And then they erupt and move, and then they get in the way, and then they get worn down, and, uh, and the lips have to overcompensate, and then we get unesthetic, thin, wrinkly lips over time, and they get long and weird. And so while our teeth don't pop out like dentures, our faces truly suffer, but over time, you know? So that's, that's, uh, so we go back to your question about, you know, TMD and, uh, and, and the development of that uh, from, from young to old. I think what we're seeing then is, is inappropriate growth mm -hmm. or unhealthy growth um, with compensation. Mm -hmm. Throw into that other genetic factors not necessarily like growth genetics, but other aspects of how we're made and you get exacerbations, mm -hmm. right? So living in our bodies is really a question of thermodynamics, right? It's like, how much energy are we using? And we can tolerate a certain amount of energy use before things break. Mm -hmm. And then at some point we reach a, a level of energy usage where things then just start breaking. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's the, the manifestation of dysfunction and breaking or excessive energy use is truly um, what we call temporal mandibular dysfunction. Great. I am writing so many notes. Excessive <laughs> energy use. This is so good. Okay, so a couple things to back up. Um, the percent of patients with TMD in those three groups, would you say there, you could say like a majority are actually muscular problems? Um, and then, so that's my one question is what category or what would be the highest percent in like which category? And then my mm -hmm. other question is pain patients. Do those usually fall into the muscular category? Mm -hmm. So a uh, hundred, yeah, a hundred percent. I think that, um, that mus muscular problems are the number one. Okay. And I think people live with those and deal with those just day to day. And they think it's part of life um, until it's not. Um, however, I think intracapsular problems like noises, um, for example, studies have been done on what they've done population studies, for example, and they say that 30% of the population has some noise in their joint. Mm -hmm. so, and that's quite a bit. I guess the question is, is at what point does noise become high energy or dysfunctional, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and, and that's, that's an important question. We, we need not treat noise mm -hmm. if, if there's no uh, energy expenditure uh, yeah. causing, you know, damage to the system. Uh, so I think, Back in the day, anybody that popped into a dental office, let's say 20, 30 years ago with noise, it was like, oh, we got to, we have to fix the click, you know? Um, and in reality, my opinion, um, noises in the joint, this is all secondary, right? The, the reasons that these things happen are, again, because of compensations and extra energy that deforms the disc elongates the disc, elongates the ligament attachments, 
so that the disc is more mobile in the joint. It's genetic for mobility. A lot of patients have are not made, their fascia is not made the way that it ought to be, and so the fascia is loose. Mm-hmm. And so if the fascia is loose, the discs are loose. And um, and that's a problem too. So um, muscles, number one, intercapsulars, close second, and uh, neurological. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way I think of neurological pain is usually it's, it's, it's either traumatic. So something traumatic happened in the area of the face uh, or it's chronic trauma. So the constant muscular pain uh, or fascial damage uh, like whiplash and things like that that cause nerve damage to the area or what we call central pain sensitization. So chronic pain in any one location can cause spread of the pain to the rest of the face as the areas of the brain that, that are responsible for that pain um, get sensitized. Mm-hmm. So that usually the neurological stuff is from long-standing issues that are left untreated or unaddressed or traumatic. Okay. Know. And I've heard people say, or some people say, like all TMD patients are airway patients, or maybe the majority. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, don't ever say all. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> don't <laughs> but I don't ever say all and mm-hmm. never say never. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, um, now, I, I mean, so let's ask, let's, let's go through the process of what we just talked about. Um, an, an airway patient, what are their major compensations um, to not being able to breathe? So, uh, well, that requires a long conversation. Maybe we'll get into it in a minute as to what causes airway problems in general, but The compensations of having difficulty breathing are almost invariably postural Mm -hmm. from the jaw to the neck, right, to to the back. I mean, it goes all the way to the toes in reality. So, but but if we're just staying in the head and the neck, it's jaw posture, neck posture um, in order to breathe better. Uh, and breathing better entails making sure that we breathe through our noses, closing our mouths and holding our jaws forward. So is that going to cause TMJ problems? Um, well, will it cause intracapsular problems? Well, yeah, if, if you're holding your jaw forward all day long, Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're generating stretching across the ligaments and you're also positioning the disc up onto the end anterior aspects of the eminence you're going to deform your disc and it's going to have a more anterior position over time or a repetitive speaking position where you have to translate forward all the time you know it's going to elongate the disc it's going to anterior displace the disc over time as those ligaments stretch out and as that's the the functional the more functional position for the disc itself so is anterior disc displacement a primary diagnosis? I don't think so. I I think for most people it's a secondary diagnosis from compensation. Hmm. So now, yeah, airway patients can or tend to have anterior displaced discs. But it, it if we look at it from a functional standpoint, I think that's more informative to our brains than than thinking of it more as a syndrome where they just kind of occur together because. Mm-hmm. But let's take, um, let's, let, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, patients that suffer airway problems and TMJ problems together most often are patients with hyperflexibility syndrome. And um, hyperflexibility syndrome comes in three flavors. Um, There are two genetic varieties. One is Ehlers-Danlos, and the other is Marfan syndrome. And then we call these connective tissue disorders. They cause people to be overly stretchy and bendy. And then the third is hyperflexibility syndrome, which is basically the trash can of stretchy people that don't have a genetic diagnosis. So Mm -hmm. they get get kind of put into that box. 
Um, so, airway. Uh, your airway is defined structurally um, by the position of the bones, but it's also defined by the fascia and the, the what we call collapsibility. Mm -hmm. So when you take a deep breath in, you're creating a lot of negative pressure, right? Mm -hmm. And that negative pressure pulls on the tissues surrounding. And if that tissue is more collapsible, more stretchy, it'll collapse. It'll, it'll come together more readily, narrowing the airway or obstructing the airway. So it's not just jaw position, but it's collapsibility uh, or um, the inherent integrity of the soft tissues and fascia in the area. So if you have somebody who has a connective tissue disorder, they're going to be more collapsible. And that's proven. That's in the literature. So those tend to have a higher rate of airway dysfunction? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Ehlers, if you take if you take a sample of 100 Ehlers-Donlos patients, mm -hmm. um, the, the occurrence of apnea in that group is, I think, 30 to 45 percent. And then if you take a group of 100 Marfan syndrome patients, it's about 40 to 50 percent. And the reason the Marfan syndrome patients are higher is because they tend to have the face that looks like the face of airway patients. Yeah. Long face. Right? Long face, small upper jaw, retruded upper jaw, lips apart. Um, so the Marfan syndrome patients have the craniofacial phenotype of of the airway patient, but they also have this, the collapsing soft tissue. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So now we have that as an airway. These, we know that these patients are at greater risk for airway problems, but what else are they at greater risk for? Well, um, ligament laxity, hypermobility. Mm -hmm. These are your patients that can open their jaws to 60 millimeters instead of mm -hmm. 40. Mm -hmm. And if they can do that while well, they're deforming their discs and stretching the ligaments, and they will have anterior disc displacement, and they will have clicking, popping, and noises, and they will have, they will get stuck open, they will get stuck closed with mm -hmm. all this disc in coordination. Are there so, other indications for doing surgery on patients with connective tissue disorders? Uh, I wouldn't say contraindications, but the surgeon better be aware of the, the, the risks. Mm -hmm. okay. I can get in, I can get into those in a minute, but um, the other aspects of connective tissue disorders that make for a TMD patient, so we know there, there's airway problems. So what is it that causes the TMD? Well, we talked about the disc displacement and all that, but they also tend to have um, nerve damage. Okay. So when you can move parts of the body beyond their you know, programmed distance that they're supposed to move, you're actually traumatizing also the nerves in the area and they generate more nerve pain. Add on top of that, that connective tissue disorder patients have something called interoception where they feel everything that goes on inside of their bodies. They are overly self-aware. These are the people that they tell you that they can hear their heartbeat mm -hmm. or they can feel it. Um, they, they're the ones that if you do dentistry on and there's a, and it's, a, it's a little bit high, they will lose their marbles because they can really feel it. Mm. Not in a crazy way, but this is their superpower. Yeah. They, they, their superpower is that they're ultimately very sensitive. And so then that leads them on a pathway towards the neurological problems more readily. Mm -hmm. Add to it that they tend to have anxiety and depression at higher, you know, higher levels than the general population, then they have a difficult time dealing with, with all these issues. Um, so definitely in those in that group, you have airway TMD all bundled together and interacting together. So that's uh that's an example where you will see that overlay uh almost all the time. Is it common for that group to not get diagnosed until like teenage or later years? I mean, because we yeah. have, I know we have patients in their like 20s or 30s and our 
physical therapists are suspecting this Mm -hmm. and they're now getting sent out for testing, but patients who have suffered all these injuries and pain and nobody's diagnosed. Interesting. In fact, in fact, they get, they often get labeled as um, malingerers, hypochondriacs, Mm -hmm. um, crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's unfair. Um, and it, and it cuts both ways. So these patients are very difficult clinically to manage. And so clinicians need to be very aware going in that, that they're in for it. And, and because it's part of informed consent, it's like, I can help you, but these are my limitations because of how you're made. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we need to be very careful as clinicians not to label these patients as crazy. We can't. Um, they're not crazy. Right. You can't imagine. So let me explain it a, uh, another way and to borrow from a, a good friend of mine, a dentist, uh, fantastic dentist, a scientist. His name is Jay Levy. And Jay uh, talks about uh, fascia and the importance of fascia. And he uses a term called uh, tensegrity. And this is an engineering term. It's Tensegrity is about, you know, when you build a building, the building has to have intrinsic uh, strength to it to prevent it from deforming. But it the ten, but it can't have so much strength that it's too brittle, where it'll it'll break and crash. So there's this balance, and that balance between flexibility and integrity is called tension integrity or tensegrity. So Jay describes that our bodies are that way. Um, and this is in the literature. It's not just Jay, but Jay does a great t- job of. I think he did a great presentation. I think it's on the AAPMD all about yeah. this. It was really good. Mm-hmm. So if, if um, so our fascia holds us together, but we have to move. So then the muscles take over and overcome the tension of our fascia so that we can move around. And, and that's great. but if your fascia is really loose because of connective tissue disorders, what holds you together? It's your muscles. Mm-hmm. So your muscles then are overworking and that's where all the pain comes from mm-hmm. and trying to keep yourself like together and held together. So you don't fly apart. That, that tensegrity is really uh, integral. And when you have these patients that don't have it, it's all muscular. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're trying to establish a good bite. You're trying to um, get them to have proper facial function. And it's hard because they're always compensating for the lack of integrity or tensegrity in their system. Yes. And there's got to be a lot of balance because if you're working on relaxing the muscles, then they're going to lose some of that stability, right? Yep. So that's kind of a challenge, I would <laughs> think for like, like a physical therapist working with someone, which with such issues, if you're doing, you know, relaxing muscles to get them out of pain, then I guess it's a whole like postural tone issue, right? Yeah, because that's, that's where the, like the Pilates and the core work comes in for these patients. You don't want to, you don't want them to go in, you know, CrossFit wise, for example, Mm-hmm. because they'll tear something mm-hmm. right they'll they'll really hurt themselves but if you do these really deliberate core strengthening type things that's that gives them the integrity that they need by developing the core muscles around yeah. this loose system so back to back to your question about um does it go undiagnosed and the answer is absolutely positively all the time mm-hmm. um i've had patients come to my office for jaw surgery and we take a you know, I take a really complete history and I've got these kids that have kyphosis, lordosis. They have uh, injuries from sports in high school, uh, dislocations. Uh, they've had their arthroscop- arthroscopies already. And not one orthopedic surgeon in the whole process or physician, you know, bothered to say, this this patient has a connective tissue disorder. They just look at it as like for that. Like can can they do genetic yeah. testing? Okay. Well, there's physical exam. That's the most yeah. reliable. Okay. There's there's actually um, 
physical exam, easy, easy yeah. physical exam it's test. There's like the Baton score um, is number one, but uh, there is genetic testing. There are 12 genetic subtypes for Ehlers-Danlos mm -hmm. out of 13, and the 13th is non-genetic. So that's the hyperflexibility syndrome. Yeah. And then Marfan's obviously is genetic. So that can be tested too. So it goes undiagnosed completely and all the time. And um, and it's really, it's kind of one of those things where there's not much you can do about it other than what we talked about. Protect yourself, understand the process, strengthen your core, mm -hmm. uh, watch out for uh, valve, heart problems, things like that that come into play. Be careful with your sports. So it's helpful. but. I think the best part is for these people to realize that they're not crazy, that they're yeah. not just falling apart and made wrong, you know, that, mm -hmm. but that they have this confluence of symptoms as a result of a genetic problem. So actually, so then let's go back, just kind of tie it back together. You have somebody who, let's say, has connective tissue disorder as a young child. It's going to be not diagnosed in a young child, right? So now you have all you let's say you throw in some unhealthy growth to this situation and they're posturing. Uh, well, now they're posturing against instability, and these are going to be your worst outcomes, right? Excuse me, they're going to be the ones who suffer most through their youth and up and through their teen years. And um and this brings up an important topic, too. I hate to jump around, but I, I, I got to mention this. The age old question, does the bite uh, cause pain? And the answer to that question is not a good one because it's a terrible question. Um, and that's why clinicians through the years argue about this so often, because it's the wrong. It's the wrong question. The question really is, how does the patient respond to a bite that is not correct? <laughs> right? Patients. So our, our class three patients, for example, usually have no pain mm -hmm. because they just, you know, and they function, they eat, they their jaws move, they chew, their teeth don't align at all, but they don't really care usually. That's because there's not a lot of adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, the class three patient can't, for example, push their jaw backwards mm -hmm. to try and make appropriate sounds, right? Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of functional jaw movement. Um, posturally, there can be some issues, but less likely. But then you go to the class two patient. They're trapped. Um, yeah. They're either trapped by a deep bite or they're set back high angle and they have to compensate for everything. and. Mm -hmm. So the literature bears this out. What type of bite patients have the worst uh, pain problems? And it's the high angle class twos. So we can't, we can't say that bite causes pain. But we can say that when the bite's off and somebody has pain, we, it behooves us to figure out if it's the bite that's actually causing compensation that's leading to the pain, right? Yeah. Like A plus B equals C. It's yeah. <laughs> it's the compensation. Compensations are everything. I mean, it really comes down to yep. whatever the structural issue, underlying issue, we will compensate to maintain homeostasis mm -hmm. and that will have negative effects over time. Um, yep. Excessive energy use, like you said. Um, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> one, one, one last thing. Yes, yes. So this, this brings us to the 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 purpose of the face and um, my background prior to dentistry was philosophy and um, and French literature and um, I when trying to figure out how people compensate um, it we have to figure out well what is the overriding principles what are the overriding principles of the face right? What is the purpose of the face? And the purpose of the face is in order of importance, 
breathing. Mm -hmm. Eating, which encompasses chewing and swallowing. And then finally, communicating, Mm -hmm. which encompasses speech and facial communication. So expression. Mm -hmm. Our brains prioritize our facial function in that order. And our brains will accomplish those three things at all costs. Mm -hmm. So when you understand that that's the purpose of the face, then diagnosing the problem becomes easier. What is it that this human being is doing in order to breathe, eat, eat, and communicate? Yes. That's dysfunctional. The role of the myofunctional therapist or the speech therapist is that. (laughs) So we are basically the most important. No, right? Breathing, eating, communicating. And then it's any underlying like dysfunction throughout developmental years will can change has has the capacity to change the structural components and further compensations will ensue so we need to obviously treat dysfunction as early as possible Mm. to prevent maladaptive growth patterns and to prevent further compensations because as we get older these issues tend to get worse right um okay so i'm trying to decide which direction to go because i know we're we're running out of time. We're going over. It's fine. I, okay. I, we're, we're good. You have a little bit more time. I, yeah. I feel the philosopher in you. Well, as we're analyzing all this, I'm like, wow, he does have that degree in philosophy because it's so interesting, like just thinking about all this. Um, so a couple quick TMJ, TMD questions. Do you think TMD issues can be prevented with proper oral rest posture and functioning? in early childhood, and perhaps maybe that sort of airway-focused orthodontic treatment if needed, can that actually prevent such issues? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Great. So that's, and and going back to, this is where I have uh, become, Becca Bacow and I are are really good friends because one, she's an amazing person to begin with, but but her philosophy in treating children and intervening early in their growth and development and allowing healthy growth and development to occur, um, we see this improvement and unraveling of uh, of potential developmental problems. Whereas on my side, I see the result of it. So I see all the compensations, dysfunction and destruction caused by all of the compensating throughout the, you know, youth teen years that result in an adult who's got cosmetic issues and functional issues and pain, et cetera. So it's really fun to see that spectrum. And so, yeah, uh, orthopedically, for example, from the orthodontic point of view, the interventions are important, but I agree posturally looking i mean this is why tongue tie is such a big deal because it's like okay you have a restriction you have a low tongue posture um i i think it'll be interesting to figure out why people have tongue ties you know this is a pre-birth problem which which leads me to the next thing growth and development doesn't happen when you exit the birth canal okay this kind of stuff is happening really, really, really early. I mean, we're talking weeks into development where the mandible starts forming first. And then the maxilla starts to form in response to and and responds in growth and development to the position of the tongue and the development of the mandible itself. So this idea that we preach that the 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 mandible or the tongue drives maxillary growth is proven in utero. Mm-hmm. So yep. the idea that, you know, we're coming up with this idea in life, you know, some people don't buy into it. But we have to because it's it's like it's what's happening in utero. And mm-hmm. obviously it continues to happen once we're born. So can you? Yes, I think strengthening muscles um allow so that there's teaching people to use the parts that they have correctly and promoting healthy growth so that they can be used correctly. Mm -hmm. That's the two goals, right? So 
and and then if I can make a little comment too about speech therapy. So integral to the whole process is that is is the speech therapy. But I let me just like I turn dentistry on its head with the question of whether the bite influences pain. Speech therapy has always been about sounding correct. So the diagnosis is made whether they sound correct, whether they're making the correct sounds. Something speech therapy tends not to do is they tend not to evaluate how much effort is required to sound correct. So that evaluation needs to take place. Like how much effort is the individual making so that they can sound correct? And that's where the videos come in and analyzing how the mouth and the jaws are actually moving mm -hmm. as opposed to just listening to sound generation. So Right. You've got to watch and see. And that's also where it's important to know that myofunctional therapy is not taught in speech therapy graduate programs, at least at this point. I think it's going to it's in the process of being integrated. So the myofunctional is looking at the muscle and the function and not all speech therapists have that training. And when I got that training, I said, oh my gosh, my whole, whole world was turned around because all my evaluation process, everything was different because you see things through a different set of eyes. Um, and then I have to say this one quick quote because my mentor had said this about posture and function. Posture is the foundation of function. Every muscle movement is influenced to a lesser or greater degree by the posture from which the movement began and to which it returns. And when we're talking about orthodontic skeletal changes, we call the physiologic rest posture how the mouth should rest with the tongue gently suctioned to the palate, front, middle, back, lips closed, slight dental freeway space. She said the physiologic rest posture, the various structures involved, forms the single greatest determinant of either continued normal function or eventual relapse. So yeah. in myofunctional therapy, one of our primary focuses is on getting that correct rest posture. And we need to combine that work with the skeletal work of the dentist, the orthodontist, the jaw surgeon, you know, to get the structure right. We work on the function, get the medical components treated, whether there's allergies or breathing issues, enlarged tonsils, tongue tie, and all those pieces can come together. But I just always think of that when we have our patients who might have a lisp, um, of course, the tongue is going to push forward if the tongue doesn't fit in the mouth and rest low because that resting posture is low and forward. We need to correct muscle mm -hmm. function and rest posture and then the speech because you can't expect someone to move their tongue up and back when it just rests low and forward. So that's where myofunctional therapy plays a role in the speech portion is the speech disorder is a symptom of the underlying rest posture problem and soft tissue dysfunction. It's a symptom of, and when you don't have the training in myofunctional therapy, you just treat drill and kill speech sounds until mm. the patient's burnt out or it takes years and years to resolve. But if you treat the underlying soft tissue and postural dysfunction, the speech can just happen so much easier. So um, it's just really interesting. So um, do you in like when looking at a child, do you think you can predict that's going to be a future TMD patient just by looking at facial structure profile in a child? I mean, I mean I'm going to be honest that I don't have a lot of interactions with children clinically. Okay. So I, I think that question is probably best suited for pediatric dentists or um, uh, okay. orthodontist. Okay. Okay. And also, when you do a jaw surgery on an adult or a teenager or whatever, what's the youngest age you would do any orthognathic surgery? So the preference is for growth cessation. Um, the growth is done. Okay. That way, that way we're not treating a moving target. Okay. Um, this, is, this is a problem uh, because um, uh, when I first met uh, Christian Guillemino, uh, who is uh, the father kind of of sleep medicine in the United States. Um, his question to me was, well, how early can you get in there? Because we have to fix these problems earlier. Uh, so how early are you willing to operate the jaws? And the answer is, orthognathically, I'm not. But mm -hmm. 
now we have all these interventions, expansion, protraction, distraction, and things like that that we can do that are not orthognathic surgery. But so to answer the question, growth has to cease, and growth cessation occurs anywhere between 16 and 22 years old, depending. Okay. Standard, the standard way of assessing growth cessation among orthodontists was always to take a hand film, a hand wrist film, to see if the bones had fused in the hand wrist. And that's a great technique to figure out when the hand is done growing. But it doesn't inform us as to the face. Um, so facial growth. The best way to assess the cessation of facial growth is to look at the actual condyles of the mandible. And when the condyles of the mandible appear corticated, they have a white outline to them, okay. then usually we can be assured that facial growth is, has stopped. And so I usually operate, the earliest I've ever operated was on a 15-year-old. And but I had to inform consent the family that I might need to do it again. Like it, it we did it for psychological reasons. Uh, there, there was a very kind of obvious facial deformity, and they wanted it fixed. So I said, okay, um, I, I don't recommend it. Um, the the joints in in patients where joints are unstable, the jaw surgery is unstable. And in class three patients, for example, who are still growing, you can set the bite and then that mandible just keep going after you're done. So okay. I wait for growth to stop. Okay. Um, and I would assume most of these airway jaw surgeries, the cosmetics of the patient is actually enhanced. Like when I look at these before and after photos, yeah. a byproduct of putting the jaws where they should be, is that... I mean, obviously there's planning and you want things to look good, but when the jaws are set back, there's going to be, you know, soft tissue, excess soft tissue. And, you know, the facial structure should be more forward for better cosmetics also. <laughs> so chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm hungry. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you can, you can put the jaws. Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, if you follow, this is an important discussion. So let me let me give background. Um, where we decide to put jaws traditionally has been established by normative research. Mm -hmm. And in our discussion today, I don't know if you noticed, but I strive hard to never use the word normal mm -hmm. because normal is a measure of average. And when doing normative, uh, when analyzing normative data, it's important for us to understand what that means as human beings, but you can't apply normative data to an individual, a single person, because that person's not part of that data set. And that person doesn't necessarily sit under the 66% of people that make up that average. And if you treat to an average, you will always have an average result, which nobody wants. Everybody wants an excellent result. So the issue here is, is that um, you can take some of the work that's been done about how in the United States, the normal is maxillary retrusion. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to base where you put your maxilla on all the cephalometric analyses that have been been studied throughout the years, you're going to end up with a recessed maxilla because that's the average mm -hmm. right so technically if you put the jaws where they should have grown to in the face the aesthetic outcome will be amazing mm -hmm. right because you've done a couple things you've supported the face mm -hmm. not just the airway but you're now you're supporting the lips in the face the way that you're supposed to mm -hmm. so they will have the projection in the face that's aesthetic and then because the muscles are relaxed, mm. the muscles express themselves in greater fullness. So the lips are more full, the cheeks are relaxed, the mentalis muscle doesn't flatten or ball up. Mm -hmm. And this is all considered very aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you set the jaws in their maximum projection in the face for full support, and again, here you need to be really careful because 
if you push too far forward, you're going to make it hard for people to close their mouths around the jaw bones and the teeth. Mm -hmm. And that's anesthetic and dysfunctional. So what you end up doing is for the sake of making big airways, you've now made patients mouth breathers because mm. you've pushed too far forward. Which That's could lead to relapse, I would assume too. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so and sleep disorder. That chocolate breathing. cake, that perfect chocolate cake, right? It's you, there's a place, the right recipe, the right yeah. cook, <laughs> the right chef. There's, yeah. there's a place to put the jaws that maximizes aesthetic and function. And that's, you know, that's the clinician's job to figure that out, but not based on any normative study that's ever been done. And mm. there's a, you know, there's a trick to that, which obviously we don't, that, that's like a whole day. Yeah. Of course. On, on where to, right. to put the so, part. But, you know, it's an art, right? To everybody's specialty, the work you do, it's an art, a skill, and um, it makes perfect sense, that chocolate cake analogy. Well, and it's interesting that you say art because um, I'm not a fan of of art in jaw surgery because um, you have artists like Picasso. So you don't want to make Picasso faces <laughs> okay. with jaw surgery. Um, when we call it art, what we're saying is, is um, it's that part of what we do in science that we can't explain. Mm -hmm. And so my goal has always been the part that's artistic, I have to figure out. Yeah. You you have to be able to explain it, not just in order to better our profession, to explain it to other people, but we truly need to understand what we're doing. So, yeah. um, mm -hmm. so like I have colleagues who are amazing, like they present their post-op uh, orthognathic cases and people literally are clapping in the audience because the people look so amazing. It's like, is that art? And they do, they, they tell them, they say, Oh, you're, hey, you're an artist, you know? And, and he is, but if you break down why he's so successful at creating faces, I can tell you very scientifically why, yeah. you know, his, his techniques and his positioning and the things that he does, actually lend itself to those very successful results. And then the opposite is true. If you don't like the way that somebody, like, again, back to the orthodontist, I, the orthodontist can say, I don't like sending my patients for jaw surgery because when they come back, they look like they've had jaw surgery, Ugh. right? So I can tell you why. The mm -hmm. common mistakes that are made in orthodontic surgery that lead patients to look like they had jaw surgery. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like the patient who goes to get lip fillers you know they're the ones that you look at and you're like <laughs> what happened to that person yeah not great okay. yeah and then they're the ones that you never ever know mm -hmm. because the person knows how to make lips that look aesthetic and functional and yeah. beautiful so yeah. that's the difference yeah and that makes perfect sense to not call it art but it's a skill right a level of a skill a scientific yeah. reasoning it's not it like <laughs> I don't mean to disagree with you because it can no. be art. It just art just means that I can't tell you how I'm so yeah. good at what I do. That yeah. makes perfect sense. This is this has been so great. Just I'm gonna just sum up some of the things. I took so many notes, but we talked about sutural expansion versus orthognathic expansion. We talked about the different categories of TMD, the intracapsular, mm -hmm. muscular, neurological, and the majority of pain patients and the majority of issues might fall into the muscular category. Mm -hmm. Um, you talked about closest speaking space, the functional movement of the jaw and how we need to look at our patients from a functional perspective, watch them speak, slow down the video. Um, when people are not in a good structural position, they're going to probably compensate and the faces will suffer over time. And you call that dysfunction from excessive energy use. I love that. That is such a good thought because our bodies will break down over time from compensating. And whether they break down in the area we're compensating or referred areas or mentally, psychologically, right? Our patients, we see that. Um, and these compensations can cause the face and the joints to deform, elongate. Um, the purpose of the face, breathing, eating, communication. Those are the three main important reasons for our face. What does it need to do? How do we make that easy, pain-free, 
no compensations for that functioning person. And when we compensate, we see postural compensations, you said, from the jaw to the neck to the toes. This is where also our PTs come in to help unwind the compensations. Um, and then the disc displaces and the ligaments um, elongate and stretch. Um, we talked about airway, bones, fascia, tensegrity, which I love that term. And Dr. J. Levy does great information and presentations on that. Um, and we talked about connective tissue disorders. And um, those patients aren't crazy. They are feeling things. They're superpowers. And that's really important for us all to know. And um, a lot about TMD. And this has just been so enlightening. I have pa a page of notes. And I feel like this was so informative to okay. colleagues, to patients. Um, I'm going to spread this podcast everywhere. People are going to really benefit from this information. So I thank you so much for this hour and a half of your time on a weekday. I know you are so busy. So we are just so delighted that you were able to give us all that information. Thank you so much. Thanks. It was great. It was fun talking to you, Nicole. Thank you. Are there any uh, courses or anything you want to talk about that your um, any upcoming things or a website or anything? Well, I mean, I, I brought up before that. Um, uh, I think, I, I mean, I teach a lot and have a lot of courses. I have an orthodontic surgery, orthodontic course here in Santa Barbara. But um, I think more importantly for your audience from uh, myo, functional therapists, speech therapists, uh, dentists, pediatric, uh, orthodontic surgeons, um, the whole gamut, postural rehabilitation specialists, sleep specialists. Um, the course that Beck and I teach over three days in Seattle is is where that's at. Um, we've had, uh, you know, L Linda D'Onofrio, who I just love and adore, who introduced me quite thoroughly to speech and myofunctional therapy came and it was just a wonderful experience and exchange of ideas. And we all felt, you know, we're all motivated by it. So this, this course is meant to teach these kinds of ideas. Um, how to identify these issues in kids uh how we can intervene in in kids as early as we can and then fast forward to how to unravel all the compensations and so that's uh late october i think it's the fourth week okay. of october in kirkland um, what's the name of the course healthy growth healthy faces okay and do you have chocolate cake served there so. uh <laughs> yes chocolate <laughs> cake yeah t-shirts of chocolate cake and no. Oh, that's funny. Actually, I have seen that posted. Okay, that's great. So um, I'm going to try to attend that because that sounds like a wonderful Please learning come. opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your time and um, look forward to talking with you soon. You got it. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.